The idea of grown men playing with toy soldiers is kind of absurd. The idea of grown women or any adult doing so is absurd. But the absurdity of grown men playing with toy soldiers has a very particular historical context. H.G. Wells' book Little Wars was not, contrary to popular belief, an early set of popular war games rules. Wells was fully aware of how absurd his hobby was and lent into it hard, not simply as a form of introspection, but to extend that absurdity to actual warfare. This is a pacifist satire. This occurred to me today because I, like Wells, play with toy soldiers and because my video content has been on hiatus for quite a while, since March, when the main content on the channel was Unconditional Surrender. And in particular, my diary of my League games, which I have been keeping but haven't been posting. I was made to feel very awkward by contemporary events. The idea of talking about Russian troops fighting around Kyiv or Kharkiv was just icky. Ironically, though war games have often been marshalled as an argument for pacifism, they have often served in practice to glorify war rather than the absurdity of grown men playing with toy soldiers helping us to recognise the much more horrific absurdity of grown men doing terrible things with actual weapons. What it often does is to present war shorn of its human cost, reduced to a contest between great strategic geniuses. And I don't want to say that in a way that suggests you should feel silly or bad for playing historical war games. I don't. I enjoy playing historical war games. I simply want to point out that we all have individual lines and my line of too much ickiness was crossed six months ago. But with the passage of time, I feel more comfortable returning to the channel and in particular my commentary on Unconditional Surrender League games and potentially on other upcoming games on Board Game Arena. And there are three new Hex Encounter War games under development on BGA. One of those, Memoir 44, already has a substantial playing community and even some tactics, so will be particularly interesting to take a look at when it is finally released. Anyway, today's episode will be me looking at toy soldier games and taking them way too seriously. And it will be one of the most absurd of war game settings Games Workshop's 40k universe, and particularly its epic series of games. And I wanted to do that partly because I do in fact enjoy playing with these, and partly because it gave me an excuse to explain the recent hiatus, which I just did. The topic for today is scale, in particular the difference between playing with scale models and playing with toy soldiers. Because that is what I play with, toy soldiers not scale models. These aren't scale models, and I'm going to explain why. Because scale modelling is a totally different and significantly more popular hobby than miniature wargaming. One I've personally never been inclined towards, but which clearly a lot of people enjoy. The series of games I'm going to be talking about are the Epic Games, which Games Workshop properly kicked off in 1989 with Space Marine. This was a radical thing. At the time, Citadel miniatures were just so much better than any of their competitors, and Games Workshop brought that to a micro-scale war game, and suddenly these weren't just blobs on a stand. The original box had a whole army's worth of models, though it only actually had three types of model. A single infantry figure, a transport, and a tank. And Games Workshop invented a whole civil war for their universe fluff to justify using the same models on both sides. Technically, Space Marine wasn't the first game. The year before, they'd released a giant robot fighting game, which is compatible in terms of its rules, called Adeptus Titanicus. And since then, they've re-released these games multiple times, most recently the giant robots element of it in 2018. The question for today, which will explain the difference between scale modelling and miniature wargaming, is what is epic? Or, as it is often known, 6mm, as a scale. Wargamers refer to their scales by an approximate height of the average man, 
in contrast to model railway enthusiasts who use a letter code for the gauge of the track, or scale modellers who, sensibly, use an actual scale. So for example, Wargaming's 15mm, a very popular scale, is the also popular HO railway gauge, and the less popular 1 to 100 scale modeler scale. 6mm is usually thought of as 1 to 300, or if following the other long standing manufacturer at this scale, GHQ, as 1 to 285. And this figure, the very first infantry figure GW released for Epic, is exactly 6mm tall, 1.8 metres at 1 to 300 scale. But this, which was the second round of sculpting of Space Marines for Epic, is 6.5 millimetres. And this, a miniature from Onslaught representing a compatible, big-shouldered, power-armoured warrior, is 7 millimetres. And the Vanguard range figure, the most recent thing in this style and claiming to be of the same scale, is a staggering 10 millimetres tall, which would be 3 metres at 1 to 300. That last one is not even the same scale as the first three. 10mm is an actual, but not very popular, wargame scale, quite distinct from Epic. This is an example of scale creep, where successive sculptors want to create more detailed models, so they make them just a little bit larger each time to fit in a bit more detail. You should, despite the limits of my camera, to be able to see that on these models, the sculpting gets a little bit more detailed on each one as you move from left to right. As a result of that, the models gain a competitive advantage. They sell better. Which also means scale creep, which is a bad thing in general in miniature war games, is absolutely our fault as players for buying oversized models and encouraging it. But it does call into question whether these roughly compatible figures even have a common scale. It's worth noting Games Workshop have actively built silly revisions into their fluff to justify their own scale creep over the years, including pretending their Space Marines have always been two and a half metres tall. One of the things I actively dislike about Games Workshop, who actually, contrary to popular opinion, have done a great deal, which is good for the hobby, is that they actively train their staff to lie about their own models, manufacturing processes, etc. And the denial that they engage in scale creep as a matter of policy is one of those. Scale creep is not restricted to the infantry figures in the game. In 1988, the giant robots, the Titans, stood on 60mm round bases. Remember, at 1 to 300 scale, these things therefore have a footprint of nearly 20 metres. In the latest edition of the game, the Warhound, which is a much smaller scout version of the Titan, stands on an 80mm base. That is already a 33% scale creep. And don't even get me started on the 105mm bases on the main Titans. But to be fair, these are made up robots. So while we can see scale creep is happening, we can't use that for establishing an actual scale. That's not the case for all the vehicles in the game. Here is a historic example. This is a model of a Tiger tank at 1 to 300 scale usually called Micro Armour when you are playing with historical figures, rather than Epic when you're playing with science fiction, because what this discussion needed was more confusing terminology. The Tiger was probably the largest tank to be in regular use in any modern conflict, weighs in at over 50 tonnes, and there are genuine practical reasons tanks don't get much bigger than this. The relationship between size, cost, armour, etc. isn't linear and weight itself is a problem. There were bridges this vehicle could not cross. If a house has a basement, 50 tonnes is often more than enough to turn that basement into a concealed tank trap. Let's put the historical Tiger side by side with the 1989 Land Raider. Yeah, the Land Raider is huge, and we would expect it to be a bit bigger. The iconic Land Raider is based on the primitive Mark I tank from World War I, which was longer and wider, though not taller than the Tiger. And the Land Raider is not a tank. It's a silly dystopian sci-fi concept in post-apocalyptic worlds, where rare, more advanced, pre-apocalypse materials can be scavenged but not made, 
you can over-engineer things. The Land Raider is an infantry fighting vehicle, a transport, with so much exotic armour, so overpowered and mounted with weapons on sponsons, not a turret because turret controls would interfere with its transport capacity, that it can pretend it's a heavy tank against technologically inferior opponents. So we expect it to be bigger, though it probably shouldn't be dwarfing a tiger like this. Even if it was made of some super high-tech composites which were half the weight of steel, it would still weigh in at 120 tonnes. We can get a good sense of what's going on with the scale by making a different comparison. The dedicated transport in the 1989 Space Marine, the third of the models in the box, was the Rhino, and it is based quite closely on the American M113, which weighs in at about 12 tonnes and is quite a bit smaller than a Tiger. In fact, it's smaller than a Tiger in a similar sort of way to how a Rhino is smaller than a Land Raider. A Rhino is 20 by 15 by 11 millimetres, which, if we're using the M113 as a comparison, equates pretty closely to a scale of about 250 to 1. So the vehicles in the first version of the game are on a different scale than the infantry models. And as we'll see, that's not that weird in war games, but it's not the end of the matter. By this point, looking at the miniatures, I was well down the rabbit hole. And so the next stop was the shed. This is plastic hard. I have two thicknesses of it, one very like a thick paper, the other about one millimetre. It's really easy to work with. If you score it with a knife, it will snap along the score line. And so it's good for simple, easy architectural models at scales too small to use foam board. What am I building? That is fairly simple. I'm producing a 250 to 1 scale, which we just established is the scale of the vehicles, model of the terraced house I live in, which is a three-storey with a slightly elevated basement Edwardian house in the UK. This will give me a scale reference for the vehicles. I do have to make some compromises. This is a house in the UK, so it has a sloped roof. But you have to have flat roofs in war games because you need to be able to place infantry on top to show they are occupying the building. I've simply flattened the roof at the rear, but so that we can see the scale at the front of the house, I've kept the full elevation, but collapsed the actual roof in so that the figures can stand inside what is effectively the attic. Here, you can see the model is not yet finished, but I've slapped an undercoat on it. Just to be clear again, this is a tiny architectural model at 250 to 1 of a three-storey house with a basement. The building I live in. And as we can see, the tank works pretty well next to it. That looks about right. Here is one of the shorter buildings that came with the original Space Marine box set in 1989. So it came with that tank. It's six storeys tall, but it's only just higher than my three-storey house. So the buildings in Epic clearly aren't either the 250 to 1 of the vehicles, nor are they the 300 to 1 of the infantry. They seem to be about 500 to 1. But the madness isn't over yet. There are other scaling decisions in a war game that, that can further confuse this. Fortunately, in Epic, one tank model represents one actual tank or in this case one imaginary made up not quite a tank. But that one to one ratio is not the norm. Most games have what is called a figure scale as well as one or more miniature scales. This is a unit based up for the war game Impetus. It's a group of 13th century Russian infantry. Here 16 figures represent a unit that would have actually contained about 500 combatants. So a figure scale of about 30 to 1 of the original combatants to the figures. And games that have a figure scale obviously have a ground scale that is different to their miniature scale, because the space occupied by eight infantry in the front rank of a unit actually has to represent enough space for about 50 infantry. And if you're thinking a one-to-one -one figure scale is going to avoid that ground scale problem, you are about to be sorely disappointed. Here we see our heavy pseudo tanks moving into short engagement range with one of our giant robots. Depending on details, rules, additions, weapons, etc., the maximum engagement range for their weapons is between 50 centimeters and a meter. 
which at 250 to 1 equates to 125 to 250 metres. And by any modern standard, that seems absurdly short. We would expect primitive 20th century ballistic guns to be able to hit a target over a thousand metres away. And remember, these two groups are engaging each other with heavy lasers and plasma weapons the size of cars. And no, it doesn't really help going to 300 to 1 or 500 to 1. Even at 500 to 1, the scale of the building, the range on these weapons is less than half a kilometre. And this battlefield compression, because of the ground scale difference, doesn't just affect weapons ranges. The terrain piece I showed you at 1 to 500 represents a building sitting on a plot about 40 metres square. And this is a big, but not outrageously big, block of flats in London. It's sitting on a plot about 80 metres square. Turning it into an equivalent diagram, you can see how it dwarfs the Games Workshop terrain feature. So both the footprints of the buildings and the ranges of the weapons have been compressed compared to the vertical scale used for the miniatures, but by different amounts. The building footprints seem to operate at 1 to 1000 scale, and the weapons are somewhere around 1 to 2000. Assuming practical limitations rather than theoretical capabilities determine their range. And all of these elements are subject to the vagaries of manufacturer, including scale creep. So the answer to the question, what is epic scale, is that it's a 1 to 1 figure scale, a 1 to 300 to 1 to 250 miniature scale, a 1 to 500 vertical scale for scenery, a ground scale between 1 to 1000 for the footprints of scenery and 1 to 2000 for weapon ranges. And this is not unusual, this variation in his scale is how most miniature war games work. I don't know of any single scale miniature war game, and that should be as convincing an argument as you might need for my original assertion that miniature war gamers like me don't play with scale models. We play with toy soldiers. And while that is every bit as silly as it sounds, it's a lot safer than playing with actual soldiers, which was the point. H.G. Wells was making a century ago. Of course, the weird thing is that once you zoom out to a person eye view of a battlefield, it generally looks fine. There are no obvious visual oddities. And that is because wargaming scale isn't just seeking to solve practical problems of representing functional forces on tables small enough to actually play on, though it is doing those things. It's utilising a feature artists call hieratic scale, where things are sized in proportion to their importance, with the most important things, the toy soldiers, and particularly in this case, the vehicles, oversized compared to their surroundings. Anyway, batteries reset. Hope you enjoyed this dive into the ridiculous world of miniature wargame scales, and with future episodes, we will be back to strategy and tactics.